Hello there. This is a reading of Dracula, with relaxing rain sounds in the background to help you fall asleep. If you enjoy this podcast and want to support it and get even more readings, join me on Patreon at patreon.com slash down to sleep. There you get two episodes every week, including all readings so far and completed audiobooks. Enjoy the reading. A letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy Westenra on the 9th of May. My dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing, but I have been simply overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. I am longing to be with you, and by the sea, where we can talk together freely and build our castles in the air. I've been working very hard lately, because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies. I've been practicing shorthand very assiduously. When we are married, I shall be able to be useful to Jonathan, and if I can stenograph well enough, I can take down what he wants to say in this way and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which also I am practicing very hard. He and I sometimes write letters in shorthand, and he's keeping a stenographic journal of his travels abroad. When I'm with you, I shall keep a diary in the same way. I don't mean one of those two pages to the week with Sunday squeezed in a corner diaries, but a sort of journal which I can write in whenever I feel inclined. I do not suppose there will be much of interest to other people, but it is not intended for them. I may show it to Jonathan some day, if there is in it anything worth sharing. But it is really an exercise book. I shall try to do what I see lady journalists do. Interviewing and writing descriptions, trying to remember conversations. I'm told that with a little practice, one can remember all that goes on, or that one hears during a day. However, we shall see. I will tell you of my little plans when we meet. I just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He's well, and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all of his news. It must be so nice to see strange countries. I wonder if we, I mean Jonathan and I, shall ever see them together. There is the ten o'clock bell ringing. Goodbye. You are loving Mina. Tell me all the news when you write. You've not told me anything for a long time. I hear rumours and especially of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. A letter from Lucy to Mina. My dearest Mina, I must say you tax me very unfairly with being a bad correspondent. I wrote to you twice since we parted, and your last letter was only your second. Besides, I have nothing to tell you. There is really nothing to interest you. Town is very pleasant just now, and we go a good deal to picture galleries, and for walks, and rides in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, I suppose it was the one who was with me at the last pop. Someone has evidently been telling tales. That was Mr. Holmwood. He often comes to see us, and he and Mama get on very well together. They have so many things to talk about in common. We met some time ago a man that would just do for you, if you were not already engaged to Jonathan. He is handsome, well off, and of good birth. He is a doctor, and really clever, just fancy. He's only nine and twenty, and he has an immense lunatic asylum all under his own care. Mr. Holmwood introduced him to me, and he called here to see us, and often comes now. I think he is one of the most resolute men I ever saw, and yet the most calm. He seems absolutely imperturbable. I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. He has a curious habit of looking one straight in the face, as if trying to read one's thoughts. He tries this on very much with me, but I flatter myself that 
He has got a tough nut to crack. I know that from my glass. Do you ever try to read your own face? I do. And I can tell you, it's not a bad study. And gives you more trouble than you can well fancy if you've never tried it. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study. And I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That is slang again. But never mind. Arthur says it every day. There. It is all out. Mina, we've told all of our secrets to each other since we were children. We've slept together. We've eaten together. Laughed and cried together. And now, though I have spoken, I would like to speak more. Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I'm blushing as I write. For although I think he loves me, he has not told me so in words. But Mina, I love him. I love him. I love him. There. That does me good. I wish I were with you, dear. Sitting by the fire, undressing. As we used to sit. I would try to tell you what I feel. I do not know how I am writing this even to you. I am afraid to stop, or I should tear up the letter. And I don't want to stop. For I do so want to tell you all. Let me hear from you at once, and tell me all that you think about it. Mina, I must stop. Good night. Bless me in your prayers, and Mina, pray for my happiness. P.S. I need not tell you that this is a secret. Good night again. Lucy. Letter from Lucy to Mina. The 24th of May. My dearest Mina, Thanks, and thanks, and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you, and to have your sympathy. My dear, it never rains, but it pours. How true the old proverbs are. Here am I, who shall be twenty in September. And yet I never had a proposal till today. Not a real proposal. And today I have had three. Just fancy three proposals in one day. Isn't it awful? I feel sorry, really and truly sorry for two of the poor fellows. Mina, I am so happy that I don't know what to do with myself and three proposals. But for goodness sake, don't tell any of the girls. They would be getting all sorts of extravagant ideas and imagining themselves injured and slighted if in their very first day at home they do not get six at least. Some girls are vain. You and I, Mina dear, who are engaged and are going to settle down soon soberly into old married women, can despise vanity. Well, I must tell you about the three. But you must keep it a secret, dear, from everyone. Except, of course, Jonathan. You will tell him, because I would, if I were in your place, certainly tell Arthur. A woman ought to tell her husband everything. Don't you think so, dear? And I must be fair. Men like women, certainly their wives, to be quite as fair as they are. And women, I am afraid, are not always quite as fair as they should be. Well, my dear, number one came just before lunch. I told you of him, Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man, with the strong jaw and the good forehead. He was very cool, outwardly, but was nervous all the time. He had evidently been schooling himself as to all sorts of little things, and remembered them. But he almost managed to sit down on his silk hat, which men don't generally do when they are cool. And then, when he wanted to appear at ease, he kept playing with a lancet in a way that made me nearly scream. He spoke to me, Mina very straightforwardly. He told me how dear I was to him, though he had known me so little, and what his life would be with me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him. 
but when he saw me cry, he said that he was a brute, and he would not add to my present trouble. Then he broke off, and asked if I could love him in time, and when I shook my head, his hands trembled. With some hesitation, he asked me if I cared already for anyone else. He put it very nicely, saying that he did not want to wring any confidence from me, but only to know, because if a woman's heart was free, a man might have hope. And then, Mina, I felt a sort of duty to tell him that there was someone. I only told him that much, and as he stood up, and he looked very strong and very grave as he took both of my hands in his, and said that he hoped that I would be happy. That if I ever wanted a friend, that I must count him one of my best. Oh, Mina, dear, I can't help crying. You must excuse this letter being all blotted. Being proposed to is all very nice, and all that sort of thing. But it isn't at all the happy thing, when you have to see a poor fellow, whom you know loves you, honestly, going away, looking all broken-hearted, to know that no matter what he may say at that moment, you are passing quite out of his life. My dear, I must stop here at present. I feel so miserable, though I am so happy. Arthur has just gone, and I feel in better spirits than when I left off, so I can go on telling you about the day. Well, my dear, number two came after lunch. He is such a nice fellow, an American from Texas. He looks so young and fresh. It seems almost impossible that he's been to so many places and has had such adventures. I sympathize with poor Desdemona when she had such a dangerous stream poured in her ear. I suppose we women are such cowards that we think a man will save us from fears, and we marry him. I know now what I would do if I were a man and I wanted to make a girl love me. No, I don't, for there was Mr. Morris telling us his stories and Arthur never told any. And yet, I am somewhat previous. Mr. Quincy P. Morris found me alone. It seems that a man always does find a girl alone. No, he doesn't. For Arthur tried to make a chance, and I helping him all I could. I'm not ashamed to say it now. I must tell you beforehand that Mr. Morris doesn't always speak slang. That is to say... He never does so to strangers or before them, for he is really well educated and has exquisite manners. But he found out that it amused me to hear him talk American slang, and whenever I was present and there was no one to be shocked, he said such funny things. I am afraid, my dear, he has to invent it all, for it fits exactly into whatever else he has to say. But this is a way slang has. I do not know myself if I shall ever speak slang. I do not know if Arthur likes it. I have never heard him use any of it yet. Well, Mr. Morris sat down beside me and looked as happy and jolly as he could. But I could see all the same that he was very nervous. He took my hand in his and said ever so sweetly, Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixings of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you will go join them seven young women with the lamps when you quit. Won't you just hitch up alongside me and let us go down the long road together, driving in double harness? Well, he did look so good-humored and so jolly that it didn't seem half so hard to refuse him as it did poor Dr. Seward. So I said as lightly as I could that I did not know anything of hitching and that I wasn't broken to harness at all yet. Then he said that he had spoken in a light manner and he hoped that if he had made a mistake in doing so on so grave and so momentous an occasion for him that I would forgive him. He really did look serious when he was saying it, and I couldn't help feeling a bit serious too. I know, Mina, you will think me a horrid flirt. 
I couldn't help feeling a sort of exultation that he was number two in one day. And then, my dear, before I could say a word, he began pouring out a perfect torrent of love-making, laying his very heart and soul at my feet. He looked so earnest over it that I shall never again think that a man must be playful always, and never earnest, because he is merry at times. I suppose he saw something in my face which checked him, for he suddenly stopped, and said with a sort of manly fervour that I could have loved him if I had been free. Lucy, you are an honest-hearted girl, I know. I should not be here speaking to you as I am now if I did not believe you clean grit right through to the depths of your soul. Tell me, like one good fellow to another, is there anyone else that you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breadth again, but will be, if you will let me, a very faithful friend. My dear Mina, why are men so noble when we women are so little worthy of them? Here was I, almost making fun of this great-hearted true gentleman. I burst into tears, I'm afraid. My dear, you will think this a very sloppy letter in more ways than one. And I really felt very badly. Why can't they let a girl marry three men, or as many as want her, save all this trouble? But this is heresy, and I must not say it. I'm glad to say that, though I was crying... I was able to look into Mr. Morris's brave eyes, and I told him straight. Yes, there is someone I love, though he has not told me yet that he even loves me. I was right to speak to him so frankly, for quite a light came into his face. He put out both of his hands and took mine, and said in a hearty way, That's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning you than being in time for any other girl in the world. Don't cry, my dear. If it's for me, I'm a hard nut to crack, and I take it standing up. If that other fellow doesn't know his happiness, well, he'd better look for it soon, or he'll have to deal with me. Little girl, your honesty and pluck have made me a friend, and that's rarer than a lover. It's more unselfish, anyhow. My dear, I'm going to have a pretty lonely walk between this and Kingdom Come. Won't you give me one kiss? It'll be something to keep off the darkness now and then. You can, you know, if you like. For that other good fellow, he must be a good fellow, my dear, and a fine fellow, or you could not love him. Hasn't spoken yet. That quite won me, Mina, for it was brave and sweet of him, and noble, too. And he was so sad. So I leant over and kissed him. He stood up with my two hands in his, and as he looked down into my face, I'm afraid I was blushing very much. And he said, Little girl, I hold your hand and you've kissed me, and if these things don't make us friends, then nothing ever will. Thank you for your sweet honesty to me, and goodbye. He wrung my hand, and taking up his hat, he went straight out of the room without looking back. Without a tear, or a quiver, or a pause, and I'm crying like a baby. Why must a man like that be made unhappy, when there are lots of girls about who would worship the very ground that he trod on? I know I would if I were free, only I don't want to be free. My dear, this quite upset me. I feel I cannot write of happiness just at once. I don't wish to tell you of number three, until it can all be happy. Ever your loving, Lucy. P.S. About number three, I, I needn't tell you of number three, need I? Besides, it was also confused. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room until both his arms were wrapped around me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. I must only try in the future to show that I am not ungrateful to God for all of his goodness to me, sending me such a lover, such a husband, such a friend. 
Goodbye. Dr. Seward's Diary. Kept in phonograph. 25th of May. Ebb tied in appetite today. Cannot eat. Cannot rest. So diary instead. Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have sort of an empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I know that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went down amongst the patients. I picked out one who has afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint, and I am determined to understand him as well as I can. Today I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of the mystery. I questioned him more fully than I had ever done, with a view to making myself master of the facts of his hallucination. In my manner of doing it there was, I now see, something of a cruelty. I seemed to wish to keep him to the point of his madness, a thing which I avoid with the patience as I would the mouth of hell. Under what circumstances would I not avoid the pit of hell? Hell has its price. If there be anything behind this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards accurately. So I had better commence to do so. R. M. Renfield. Sanguine temperament. Great physical strength. Morbidly excitable. Periods of gloom. Ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish. Possibly a dangerous man. Probably dangerous, if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is as secure an armor for their foes as for themselves. What I think of on this point is... When the self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced with the centrifugal. When duty, a cause, etc., is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only accident, or a series of accidents, can balance it. Letter from Quincy Morris to Arthur Holmwood My dear Art, We've told yarns by the campfire in the prairies, and dressed one another's wounds after trying a landing at the Marquesas. We've drunk healths on the shore of Titicaca. There are more yarns to be told, and other wounds to be healed, and another health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I have no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party and that you are free. There will be only one other. Our old pal at the Korea, Jack Seward. He's coming too. And we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup and drink a health with all our hearts to the happiest man in all the wide world, who has won the noblest heart that God has made and the best worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome a loving greeting, and a health as true as your own right hand. We shall both swear to leave you at home if you drink too deep to a certain pair of eyes. Come. Yours as ever and always, Quincy P. Morris. Telegram from Arthur Homewood to Quincy Morris. Count me in every time. I bear messages which will make both of your ears tingle. Art. Chapter 6 Mina Murray's Journal 24th July Whitby Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever. We drove up to the house at the Crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The Little River, the Esk, runs through a deep valley, which broadens out just as it comes near the harbour. A great viaduct runs across with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep 
though when you're on high land on either side, you can look right across it, unless you're near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red-roofed, and seem piled up one over the other anyhow, like the pictures that we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, and which is the scene of part of Marmion, where the girl was built up in the wall. It's a most noble ruin of immense size, and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There's a legend that a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town, there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This is, to my mind, the nicest spot in Whitby. It lies right over the town, and has a full view of the harbour, and all up the bay, to where the headland called the Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbour, that part of the bank has fallen away. Some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place, part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the sandy pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them through the churchyard. People go and sit there all day, looking at the beautiful view, enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here very often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now, with my book on my knee, listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting besides me. They seem to do nothing all day but sit up here and talk. The harbour lies below me, with on the far side one long granite wall stretching out into the sea, with a curve outwards at the end of it, in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy sea wall runs along outside of it, on the near side, the sea wall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and its end, too, has a lighthouse. Between the two piers, there is a narrow opening into the harbour, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high water, but when the tide is out, it shoals away to nothing, and there is merely the stream of the Esk, running between banks of sand, with rocks here and there. Outside the harbour on this side, there rises for about half a mile a great reef, the sharp edge of which runs straight out from behind the south lighthouse. At the end of it is a boy with a bell, which swings in bad weather and sends a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out at sea. I must ask the old man about this. He's coming this way. He's a funny old man. He must be awfully old. His face is gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me he's nearly a hundred, that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I am afraid, a very sceptical person, for when I asked him about the bells at sea and the White Lady, he said very brusquely, I wouldn't fash myself about them, miss. Them things be all wore out. Mind, I don't say that there never was, but I do not say that there wasn't in my time. They be all very well for comers and trippers and the like, but not for a nice young lady like you. Them feet folks from York and Leeds be always eating cured errands and drinking tea, looking out to buy a cheap jet with Creed or... I wonder myself who'd be bothered telling lies to them. Even the newspapers which is full of fool talk. I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin when the clock struck six, whereupon he laboured to get up and said, I must be going home now, miss. My granddaughter doesn't like to be kept waiting when the tea is ready, for it takes me time to crammel down the grease for there be many of them, miss a lack belly timber sailly by the clock. He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. 
The steps are a great feature on the place. They lead from the town up to the church. There are hundreds of them. I do not know how many, and they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must originally have had something to do with the abbey. I shall go home too. Lucy went out visiting with her mother, and as they were only duty calls, I did not go. They will be home by this. Chapter 7 Mina Murray's Journal 1st of August I came up here an hour ago with Lucy. We had a most interesting talk with my old friend and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them, and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything, and downfaces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, he bullies them, and then takes their silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful colour since she's been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming up and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with old people, I think they all fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave me double share instead. I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try and remember and put it down. It'll be all full talk, lock, stock and barrel. That's what it be, now else. These bands and wafts and bark ghosts and bar guests and boggles and all anent them. It's only fit to set bairns and dizzy women a bewildering. They be nowt but air blebs. They in all grims and signs and warnings be invented by parsons and illsome book bodies, railway touters to skeer and scunner halflings to get folks to do something that they don't otherwise incline to. Makes me eyeful to think of them. Why, it's them that, not content with printing lies and paper and preaching them out of pulpits, does want to be cutting them on tombstones. Look here, all around you, in what air you will. All them steens holding up their heads, as well as they can out of their pride. Simply tumbling down with the weight of the lies wrought on them. Here lies the body, sacred to the memory wrought on all of them. And yet in nigh half of them there bean't no bodies at all and the memories of them being cared a pinch of snuff about. Much less sacred. Lies, all of them. Nothing but lies, of one kind or another. My gog, it'll be a queer scoundment at dear judgment when they come tumbling up in their death sacks, all duped together and trying to drag their tombstones with them to prove how good they was. Some of them trembling and dithering, with their hands that dozened and slippy from lying in the sea that they can't even keep their grip of them. I could see from the old fellow's self-satisfied air and the way in which he looked around for approval of his cronies that he was showing off. So I put in a word to keep him going. Oh, Mr. Swales, you can't be serious. Surely these tombstones are not all wrong. Yablins. There may be a poorish few not wrong, saving where they make out the people too good. For there be folk that do think a barn bowl be like the sea. If only it be their own, the whole thing be only lies. Now look you here. You come here, stranger, and you see this Kirk Garth. I nodded, for I thought it better to assent, though I did not quite understand his dialect. I knew it had something to do with the church. He went on. And you can say it that all these steens be a boon folk that be happed here, snod and snog. I assented again. Then that be just where their lie comes in. Why, there be scores of these lay beds that be tomb as old Dunn's backer box on Friday night. He nudged one of his companions and they all laughed. My gog, how could they be otherwise? Look at that one. Read it. I went over and read. Edward... Spenslar, Master Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andres, April 1854. When I come back, Mr. Swales went on. 
Who brought him home, I wonder, to Happy Mere? Murdered off coast of Andres, and you conceited his body lay under. Why, I could name ye a dozen whose bones lie in the Greenland seas above, where the currents may have drifted them. There may be steens around ye. Ye can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. This, Braithwaite Lowry, I knew his father, lost in the lively off Greenland in twenty. Or Andrew Woodhouse, drowned in the same seas in 1777. John Paxton, drowned off Cape Farewell a year later. Or old John Rawlins, whose grandfather sailed with me, drowned in the Gulf of Finland in fifty. Do you think that all these men will have to make a rush to Whitby when the trumpet sounds? I have me anthems about it. I tell you, that when they got here, they'd be jumbling and jostling one another that way, that it'd be like a fight up on the ice of the old days, when we'd be at one another from daylight to dark, trying to tie up our cuts by the light of the Aurora Borealis. This was evidently a local pleasantry, for the old man cackled over it, and his cronies joined in with gusto. But, I said, surely you are not quite correct, for your start on the assumption that all the poor people, or their spirits, will have to take their tombstones with them on the Day of Judgment. Do you think that will be really necessary? Well, what else be their tombstones for? Answer me that, miss. To please their relatives, I suppose. To please their relatives, you suppose, he said with intense scorn. How will it pleasure their relatives to know that lies is wrought over them? That everybody in the place knows that there be lies? He pointed to a stone at our feet, which had been laid down as a slab on which the seat was rested, close to the edge of the cliff. Read the lies on that. The letters were upside down to me from where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them, so she leant over and read. Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in the hope of a glorious resurrection on July 29th, 1873. Falling from the rocks at Kettleness, this tomb was erected by his sorrowing mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Really, Mr. Swales, I don't see anything very funny in that. She spoke her comment very gravely and somewhat severely. You don't see how funny. But that's because you don't know the sorrowing mother was a hell cat that hated him because he was a crew kid. A regular lamentary he was. He hated her, so that he committed suicide in order that she mightn't get an insurance that she put on his life. He blew nigh the top of his head off with an old musket one they had for scaring the crows with. That's the way that he fell off the rocks, and as to hopes of a glorious resurrection, I've often heard him say myself that he hoped he'd go to hell, for his mother was so pious that she'd be sure to go to heaven, and he didn't want to addle where she was. Now isn't that steering at any rate? He hammered it with his stick as he spoke, a pack of lies. And won't it make Gabriel keckle when Geordie comes panting up the grease with the tombstone balanced on his hump and asks for it to be took as evidence? I did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as she said, rising up. Oh, why did you tell us all of this? It's my favourite seat, and I cannot leave it. And now I find I must go sitting over the grave of a suicide. Ah, that won't harm you, my pretty. And it make the poor Geordie gladsome to have so trim a lass sitting on his lap. That won't hurt ye. Why, I've sat here off and on for the nigh twenty years past, and hasn't done me no harm. Don't ye fash about them as lies under ye, or that doesn't lie there either. It'll be time for ye to be getting scart when ye see the tombstones all run away with, and the place as bare as a stubble field. There's the clock. I must be gone. My service to you, ladies. And off he hobbled. Lucy and I sat a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat. She told me all over again about Arthur and their coming marriage. That made me just a little heart sick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day, I came up here alone, for I am very sad. 
there was no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over the town, sometimes in rows where the streets are and sometimes singly. They run right up the esque and die away in the curve of the valley. To my left, the view is cut off by a black line of roof of the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and lambs are bleating in the fields away behind me, and there is a clatter of donkeys' hoofs up the paved road below. The band on the pier is playing a harsh waltz in good time. Further along the quay, there is a Salvation Army meeting in a back street. Neither of the bands hears the other. But up here, I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is and if he is thinking of me. I wish he were here. Dr. Seward's Diary 5th of June The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities very largely developed. Selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not yet know. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in it that I sometimes imagine he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. To my astonishment he did not break out into a fury, as I expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment and then said, May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said that would do. I must watch him. 18th of June. He has turned his mind now to spiders and has got several very big fellows in a box. He feeds them with his flies and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished. Although he has used half his food, in attracting more flies from outside to his room. First of July. His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies. Today I told him he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said that he must clear out some of them at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced in this, and I gave him the same time as before for reduction. He disgusted me much whilst I was with him, for when a horrid blowfly bloated with some carrion food buzzed into the room, he caught it, held it for a few moments between his finger and a thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, he put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was very good and very wholesome, that it was his life, strong life, it gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiments of one, where I must watch how he gets rid of his spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind. He keeps a little notebook in which he is always jotting down something. Whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers added up in batches. Then the totals are added in batches again, as though he were focusing some account, as the auditors put it. 8th of July. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon, and then, oh unconscious celebration, you will have to give the wall to your conscious brother. I kept away from my friend for a few days, so that I might notice if there were any change. Things remain as they were except he has parted with some of his pets and got a new one. He has managed to get a sparrow, and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain are well fed, for he still brings in the flies, tempting them with his food. 
19th of July. We are progressing. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows. His flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favour. A very, very great favour. As he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, and he said, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, A kitten. A nice little sleek, playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and feed and feed. I was not unprepared for this request. I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size and vivacity. But I did not care that his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and the spiders. So I said I would see about it and asked him if he would not rather have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered. Oh yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten lest you should refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten, would they? I shook my head and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell and I could see a warning of danger in it. There was a sudden, fierce, sidelong look which meant killing. The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving and see how it works out. Then I shall know more. 10 p.m. I visited him again and found him sitting in a corner brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me and implored me to let him have a cat, that his salvation depended upon it. I was firm, however, and told him he could not have it, whereupon he went without a word, and sat down gnawing his fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning, early. 20th of July. Visited Renfield very early, before the attendant went his rounds. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved in the window and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again, and beginning it cheerfully and with good grace. I looked around for his birds, and not seeing them, I asked him where they were. He replied, without turning around, that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room, and on his pillow a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went on and told the keeper to report to me if there was anything odd about him during the day. 11am. The attendant has just been to me to say that Renfield has been very sick, and disgorged a lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he's eaten his birds, and he took them and ate them raw. 11pm. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight enough to make even him sleep. I took away his pocketbook to look at it. The thought that's been buzzing around my brain lately is complete, and the theory proved. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him, and call him a Zoophagus, a life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can. He has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider and many spiders to one bird. Then he wanted a cat to eat the many birds and what would have been his later steps. It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might be done if only there were a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection and look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect? The knowledge of the brain. Had I even the secret of one such mind, did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic, I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden Sanderson's physiology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing. If only there were a sufficient cause... I must not think too much about this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may not I too
to be of an exceptional brain, congenitally. How well the man reasoned. Lunatics always do within their own scope. I wonder at how many lives he values a man, or if at only one. He's closed the account most accurately, today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me it seems only yesterday that my whole life ended with my new hope, and that truly I began a new record. So it will be until the great recorder sums me up and closes my ledger account with a balance to profit or loss. Oh Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must only wait on hopeless and work, work, work. If only I could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend there, a good unselfish cause to make me work. That would be indeed happiness. Mina Murray's Journal, 26th of July. I am anxious and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time, and there is also something about the shorthand symbols that make it different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy and about Jonathan. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time, and was very concerned. But yesterday, dear Mr. Hawkins, who is always so kind, sent me a letter from him. I had written asking him if he had heard, and he said the enclosed had just been received. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then to Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we've decided that I'm to lock the door of our room every night. Mrs. Westenra has got an idea that sleepwalkers go out on roofs of houses and along the edges of cliffs. Suddenly wakened, they fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear. She's naturally anxious about Lucy, and tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit. He would get up in the night dress himself and go out, if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn. She's already planning out her dresses and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathize with her, for I do the same. Only Jonathan and I will start in life in a very simple way, and she'll have to try to make both ends meet. Mr. Holmwood, he is the Honourable Arthur Holmwood, only son of Lord Godalming coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, for his father is not very well. I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up to the seat on the churchyard cliff, show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say it's the waiting which disturbs her. She'll be all right when he arrives. 27th of July. No news from Jonathan. I'm getting quite uneasy about him though why I should I do not know, but I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever. Each night I am awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so hot she cannot get cold, but still the anxiety and the perpetually being wakened is beginning to tell on me. I'm getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. homewood has been suddenly called to ring to see his father, who's been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She's a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely rose pink. She's lost that anemic look which she had. I pray it will all last. 3rd of August. Another week gone, and no news from Jonathan. Not even to Mr. Hawkins, from whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he's not ill. He surely would have written. 
I look at that last letter of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him, yet it is his writing. There is no mistake of that. Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week, but there is an odd concentration about her which I do not understand. Even in her sleep, she seems to be watching me. She tries the door, and finding it locked, goes about the room searching for the key. 6th of August. Another three days, and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to, or where to go to, I should feel easier, but no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening. The fishermen say we're in for a storm. I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. Today is a grey day, and the sun, as I write, is hidden in thick clouds, high over Kettleness. Everything is grey, except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it. Grey earthy rock grey clouds tinged with the sunburst at the far edge, hanging over a grey sea, into which the sand points stretch like grey fingers. The sea is tumbling, tumbling in over the shallows and the sandy flats with a roar, muffled in the sea mists drifting inland. The horizon is lost in a grey mist. All is vastness. The clouds are piled up like giant rocks, and there is a brawl over the sea that sounds like some presage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist, and seem men like trees walking. The fishing boats are racing for home, and rise and dip in the ground swell as they sweep into the harbour, mending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr. Swales making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I've been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss. I could see he was not at ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine, and I asked him to speak fully. So he said, leaving his hand in mine. I'm afraid, my dearie, I must have shocked you by all the wicked things I've been saying about the dead and such like for the weeks past, but I didn't mean them. And I want ye to remember that when I'm gone, we old folks that be daffled and with one foot abaft the crook hole don't altogether like to think of it. We don't want to feel scart of it, and that's why I've took to making light of it so I'd cheer up my own heart a bit. But Lord love ye, miss. I ain't afraid of dying. Not a bit. Only I don't want to die if I can help it. My time must be nigh at hand now, for I be old, and a hundred years is too much for any man to expect. And I'm so nigh that it might the old man is already wet in his scythe. You see, I can't get out of the habit of caffing about it all at once. The chafts will wag as they used to. Some day soon, the angel of death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't ye dole and greet, my dearie, for he saw that I was crying. If he should come this very night, I'd not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only a waiting for something else than what we're doing, and death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content, for it's coming to me, my dearie, and it's coming quick. It may be coming while we be looking and wondering. Maybe it's in that wind out over the sea that's bringing in with it loss and wreck and sore distress and sad hearts. Look. Look, he cried suddenly. There's something in that wind, and in the host beyond that sounds and looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it coming. 
Lord, make me answer cheerful when my call comes. He held up his arms devoutly and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me and blessed me and said goodbye and hobbled off. It all touched me and upset me very much. I was glad when the Coast Guard came along with his spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk to me as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. I can't make her out, he said. She's a Russian by the look of her, but she's knocking about in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open or to put in here. Look there again. She steered mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel. Changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time tomorrow. Chapter 7 Cutting from the Daily Graph, 8th of August Pasted into Mina Murray's journal From a Correspondent One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather has been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as was ever known, and the great body of holidaymakers laid out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robin Hood's Bay, Rig Mill, Runswick, Staithes, and the various trips in the neighbourhood of Whitby. The steamers, Emma and Scarborough, made trips up and down the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping, both to and from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff churchyard, and from that commanding eminence watch the wide sweep of sea, visible to the north and east, called attention to a sudden show of mare's tails, high in the sky to the northwest. The wind was then blowing from the southwest in the mild degree, which in barometrical language is ranked number two light breeze. The coast guard on duty at once made report, and one old fisherman, who for more than half a century has kept watch on weather signs from East Cliff, foretold in an emphatic manner the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of a sunset was so very beautiful, so grand in its masses of splendidly coloured clouds, that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff in the old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its downward way was marked by a myriad of clouds of every sunset colour. Flame, purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold. With here and there masses, not large, but of seemingly absolute blackness. In all sorts of shapes as well, outlined as colossal silhouettes. The experience was not lost on the painters and Doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude to the great storm will grace the RA and our rivals in May next. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that his cobble, or his mule as they term the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbour till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat and that prevailing intensity which, on the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but a few lights in sight at sea, for even the coasting steamers which usually hug the shore so closely kept well to seaward, and but a few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner, with all sails set, seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment while she remained in sight. 
efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in face of her danger. Before the night shut down, she was seen with sails idly flapping, as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea. Shortly before ten o'clock, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive. The silence was so marked that the bleating of a sheep inland or the barking of a dog in the town was distinctly heard. The band on the pier with its lively French air was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke, with a rapidity which at the time seemed incredible, and even afterwards is impossible to realize. The whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow till in a very few minutes the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White crested waves beat madly on the level sands and rushed up to the shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spume swept the lanthorns of the lighthouses which rise from the end of either pier of Whitby Harbour. The wind roared like thunder, and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet or clung with grim clasp to the iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear the entire piers from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have been increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white, wet clouds which swept by in a ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their living brethren with the clammy hands of death, and many a one shuddered as the wreaths of sea mist swept by. At times the mist cleared, and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lightning, which now came thick and fast, followed by such sudden peals of thunder that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some of the scenes thus revealed were of immeasurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. The sea, running mountains high through skywards with each wave mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into space. Here and there a fishing boat, with a rag of sail running madly for shelter before the blast. Now and again the white wings of a storm-tossed seabird. On the summit of the east cliff the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got it into working order, and in the pauses of the inrushing mist swept with it the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective, as when a fishing boat with gunwale underwater rushed into the harbour, able by the guidance of the sheltering light to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. As each boat achieved the safety of the port, there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on shore, a shout which for a moment seemed to cleave the gale and was then swept away in its rush. Before long, the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner with all sails set, apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had by this time backed to the east, and there was a shudder amongst the watchers on the cliff as they realized the terrible danger in which she now was. Between her and the port, lay the great flat reef on which so many good ships have from time to time suffered, and with the wind blowing from its present quarter, 
it would be quite impossible that she should fetch the entrance of the harbour. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that in their troughs the shallows of the shore were almost visible, and the schooner with all sails set was rushing with such speed that, in the words of one old sort, she must fetch up somewhere if it was only in hell. Then came another rush of sea fog, greater than any hitherto, a mass of dank mist which seemed to close on all things like a grey pall, and left available to men only the organ of hearing, for the roar of the tempest and the crash of the thunder and the booming of the mighty billows came through the damp oblivion even louder than before. The rays of the searchlight were kept fixed on the harbour mouth across East Pier, where the shock was expected and men waited, breathless. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast and the remnant of the sea fog melted in the blast, and then Mirabil Dictu. Between the piers, leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before the blast with all sails set and gained the safety of the harbour. The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was a corpse with a drooping head, which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on deck at all. A great awe came on all as they realized that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbor unsteered, save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbor pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel washed by many tides and many storms into the southeast corner of the pier, jutting under East Cliff. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sand heap. Every spar, rope, and stay was strained, and some of the top hammer came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below as if shot up by the concussion. Running forward, jumped from the bow onto the sand, making straight for the steep cliffs where the churchyard hangs over the laneway to East Pier, so steeply that some of the flat tombstones, or through stones as they call them in the Whitby vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff has fallen away. It disappeared into the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tate Hill Pier, as all those whose houses are in close proximity were either in bed or on the heights above. Thus, the Coast Guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbour at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb on board. The men working the searchlight after scouring the entrance of the harbour without seeing anything, turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The coast guard ran aft and, when he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it and recoiled at once as though under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique general curiosity and quite a number of people began to run. It's a good way round from the west cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier but your correspondent's a fairly good runner, and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd, whom the Coast Guard and police refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck, and was one of a small group who saw the dead seaman whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised or even awed, for not often can such a sight have been seen. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other, 
to the spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened around both wrist and wheel, all kept fast by binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel and dragged him to and fro. The cords with which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and a doctor, Surgeon J. M. Caffin, of 33 East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared after making examination that the man must have been dead for quite two days. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked, empty save for a little roll of paper, which proved to be the addendum to the log. The Coast Guard said the man must have tied his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was first on board may save some complications later on in Admiralty Court, for Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage which is the right of the first civilian on entering a derelict. Already, however, the legal tongues are wagging, and one law student is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed, his property being held in contravention of the statutes of Mordmain, since the tiller as emblemship, if not proof of a delegated possession, is held in a dead hand. It's needless to say that the dead steersman has been reverently removed from the place where he held his honourable watch, a steadfastness as noble as that of the young Casabianca, placed into the mortuary to await inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing, its fierceness is abating, crowds are scattering homeward, the sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire walls. I shall send in time for your next issue. Further details of the derelict ship, which found her way so miraculously into harbour in the storm. 9th of August. The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is a Russian from Varna and is called the Demeter. She is almost entirely in ballast of silver sand with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mould. This cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington, of Seven, the Crescent, who this morning went aboard and formally took possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship, paying all harbour dues. Nothing is talked about here today except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exacting in seeing that every compliance has been made with existing regulations. As the matter is to be a nine days wonder, they are evidently determined that there shall be no cause of after complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck. More than a few members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened and made its way on to the moors, where it is still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later it should become itself a danger. It is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning, a large dog, a half-bred mastiff belonging to a coal merchant, was found dead in the roadway opposite its master's yard. It had been fighting, and manifestly had had a savage opponent. Its throat was torn away, and its belly was slit open, as if with a savage claw. Later, by the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest except as to facts of missing men. 
The greatest interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was today produced at the inquest, and a more strange narrative than the two between them unfolded has not been my lot to come across. There is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them and accordingly send you a rescript, simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania before he got into the blue water, and this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken cum grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly translated for me, time being short. Log of the Demeter Varna to Whitby Written 18th of July Things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate note henceforth till we land. On 6th July, we finished taking in cargo, silver sand, and boxes of earth. At noon set sail, east wind, fresh, crew, five hands, two mates, cook, and myself, captain. On 11 July, at dawn entered Bosphorus, boarded by Turkish customs officers, backsheesh, all correct, underway at 4pm. On 12th of July, through Dardanelles, more customs officers and flagboat of guarding squadron, backsheesh again, work of officers thorough but quick, want us off soon. On 13th of July, past Cape Matapan. Crew dissatisfied about something. Seemed scared, but would not speak out. On 14th of July, somewhat anxious about crew. Men all steady fellows who sailed with me before. Mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him there was something, and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them that day and struck him. He expected fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16th of July, mate reported in the morning that one of crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Could not account for it. Men more downcast than ever. All said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more than there was something aboard. Mate, getting very impatient with them, feared some trouble ahead. 17th of July. Yesterday, one of the men, Olgren, came to my cabin, and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he had been sheltering behind the deckhouse, as there was a rainstorm, when he saw a tall, thin man, who was not like any of the crew, and came up the companionway to go along the deck forward and then disappear. He followed cautiously, but when he got to the bows, found no one. The hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I am afraid the panic may spread. To allay it, I shall today search the entire ship carefully from stem to stern. Later in the day, I got together the whole crew and told them, as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship that we should search from stem to stern. First mate angry, said it was folly, and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the men. Said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with a hand spike. I let him take the helm, while the rest began thorough search, all keeping abreast with lanterns. We left no corner unsearched. There were only the big wooden boxes. There were no odd corners where a man could hide. Men much relieved when search over went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled, but said nothing. 22nd of July. Rough weather last three days, all hands busy with sails. No time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread. Mate cheerful again and all on good terms. Praised men for work in bad weather. Past Gibraltar, out through the straits. All well. 24th of July. There seems some doom over this ship. Already a hand short and entering on the Bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead. And yet last night another man lost. 
disappeared. Like the first, he came off his watch and was not seen again. Men, all in a panic of fear, sent around Robin, asking to have double watch as they fear to be alone. Mate angry, fear there will be some trouble as either he or the men will do some violence. 28th of July. Four days in hell, knocking about in a sort of maelstrom, the wind of a tempest. No sleep for anyone. Men all worn out, hardly know how to set a watch, since no one fit to go on. Second mate volunteered to steer and watch and let men snatch a few hours sleep. Wind abating. Seas terrific, but feel them less. Ship is steadier. 29th of July. Another tragedy. Had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck, could find no one except the steersman. Raised outcry and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Now without second mate. Crew in panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth and wait for any signs of cause. 30th of July. Last night rejoiced. We are nearing England. Weather fine, all sails set. Retired, worn out, slept soundly. Awaked by mate telling me that both men of watch and steersman missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work ship. 1st of August. Two days of fog. Not a sail sighted. Had hoped when in the English Channel to be able to signal for help. To get in somewhere. Not having power to work sails. Have to run before wind. Dare not lower as could not raise them again. We seem to be drifting to some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of men. His stronger nature seems to have worked inwardly against himself. Men are beyond fear. Working stolidly and patiently with minds made up to worst. They are Russian. He Romanian. 2nd of August, midnight. Woke up from a few minutes sleep by hearing a cry. Seemingly outside my port. Could see nothing in fog. Rushed on deck, ran against mate. Tells me he heard cry and ran. But no sign of man on watch. One more gone. Lord help us. Mate says we must be past the Straits of Dover as in a moment of fog lifting he saw the North Foreland, just as he heard the man cry out. If so, we are now off in the North Sea, and only God can guide us in the fog. God seems to have deserted us. 3rd of August. At midnight, I went to relieve the man at the wheel, and when I got to it I found no one there. The wind was steady. And as we ran before, there was no yawing. I dared not leave it, so I shouted for the mate. After a few seconds, he rushed up on deck in his flannels. He looked wild-eyed and haggard. I greatly fear his reason has given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely with his mouth to my ear, as though fearing the very air might hear. It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night, I saw it. Like a man, tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows, looking out. I crept behind it and gave it my knife. But the knife went through it, empty as the air. And as he spoke, he took his knife and drove it savagely into space. He went on. But it is here, and I'll find it. It is in the hold, perhaps in one of those boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one. You work the helm. And with a warning look and his finger on his lip, he went below. There was a springing up, a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with a tool chest and a lantern and go down the forward hatchway. He's mad, stark, raving mad, and it's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They are invoiced as clay. To pull them apart is as harmless as a thing as he can do. So here I stay, and mind the helm, and write these notes. I can only trust in God, and wait till the fog clears. Then if I can't steer to any harbour with the wind that is, 
I shall cut down sails and lie by, and signal for help. It is nearly all over now. Just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, I heard him knocking away at something in the hold, and work is good for him. There came up the hatchway a sudden, startled scream. It made my blood run cold. And up on the deck he came as if shot from a gun, a raging madman with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed with fear. Save me, save me, he cried. He looked around on the blanket of fog, his horror turned to despair. And in a steady voice he said, You had better come too, Captain, before it is too late. He is there. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him, and it is all that is left. Before I could say a word or move forward to seize him, he sprang on the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too now. It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one, and now he has followed them himself. God help me. How am I to account for all of these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port. Will that ever be? 4th of August. Still fog, which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is sunrise because I am a sailor, why else I know not. I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed. And in the dimness of the night, I saw it. Him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a man, to die like a sailor in blue water. No man can object. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster, for I shall tie my hands to the wheels when my strength begins to fail. Along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul. My honor as a captain. I am growing weaker and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, mayhap this bottle may be found, and those who find it may understand. If not, then all men shall know that I have been true to my trust. God and the Blessed Virgin and the saints help a poor, ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course, the verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce, and whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there is now none to say. The folk here hold almost universally that the captain is simply a hero. He is to be given a public funeral. Already it is arranged that his body is to be taken with a train of boats up the Esk for a piece, and then brought back to Tate Hill Pier, up the Abbey Steps. He is to be buried in the churchyard on the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given in their names as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has been found of the great dog, at which there is much mourning, for with public opinion in its present state he would, I believe, be adopted by the town. Tomorrow we will see the funeral, and so will end this one more mystery of the sea. Mina Murray's Journal, 8th of August. Lucy was very restless all night, and I too could not sleep. The storm was fearful, and as it boomed loudly among the chimney pots, it made me shudder. When a sharp puff came, it seemed to be like a distant gun. Strangely enough, Lucy did not wake, but she got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately, each time I awoke in time and managed to undress her without waking her, and got her back to bed. It is a very strange thing, this sleepwalking, for as soon as her will is thwarted in any physical way, her intention, if there be any, disappears. She yields herself almost exactly to the routine of her life. Early in the morning, we both got up and went down to the harbour to see if anything had happened in the night. There were very few people about, and though the sun was bright and the air clear and fresh, the big 
grim-looking waves that seemed dark themselves because the foam that topped them was like snow forced themselves in through the narrow mouth of the harbour, like a bullying man going through a crowd. Somehow I felt glad that Jonathan was not on the sea last night, but on land. But is he on land or sea, and where is he, and how? I'm getting fearfully anxious about him. If only I knew what to do, and could do anything. 10th of August The funeral of the poor sea captain today was most touching. Every boat in the harbour seemed to be there. The coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hill Pier up to the churchyard. Lucy came with me, and we went early to our old seat, whilst the cortege of boats went up the river to the viaduct and came down again. We had a lovely view, and saw the procession nearly all the way. The poor fellow was laid to rest quite near our seat, so that we stood on it when the time came and we saw everything. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time, and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. She is quite odd in one thing. She will not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness, or if there be, she does not understand it herself. There is an additional cause in that poor old Mr. Swales was found dead this morning on our seat, his neck broken. He had evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in the seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror on his face that men said made them shudder. Poor dear old man. Perhaps he had seen death with his dying eyes. Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influences more acutely than other people do. Just now she was quite upset by a little thing which I did not much heed though I am myself very fond of animals. One of the men who came up here often to look for the boats was followed by his dog. The dog is always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry nor heard the dog bark. During the service, the dog would not come to its master, who was on the seat with us, but kept a few yards off, barking, howling. Its master spoke to it gently, and then harshly, and then angrily. But it would neither come nor cease to make a noise. It was in a sort of fury, with its eyes savage, its hairs bristling out like a cat's tail when puss is on the warpath. Finally, the man too got angry and jumped down and kicked the dog. He took it by the scruff of the neck and half dragged and half threw it on a tombstone on which the seat is fixed. The moment it touched the stone, the poor thing became quiet and fell into a tremble. It did not try to get away, but crouched down, quivering, cowering, and was in such a pitiable state of terror that I tried without effect to comfort it. Lucy was full of pity too, but she did not attempt to touch the dog, but looked at it in an agonized sort of way. I greatly fear that she is of too super-sensitive a nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this tonight, I'm sure. The whole agglomeration of things, the ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads. The touching funeral, the dog, now furious, now in terror. It will all afford material for her dreams. I think it will be best for her to go to bed, tired out physically. So I shall take her for a long walk by the cliffs to Robin Hood's Bay and back. She ought not to have much inclination for sleepwalking, then. And that is where we close the book on tonight's episode of Down to Sleep, and it is the end of that chapter of Dracula. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I hope that you enjoyed this reading and that it helped you relax and drift off to sleep tonight.